In 1949, the Kuomintang regime retreated to Taiwan, and the once mighty Republic of China found itself reduced to nothing but islands. The major island, of course, being the once Japanese colony of Taiwan, but it also held the island of Hainan. That state of affairs, though, would not last for long. A year later, in 1950, the Communist Armed Forces, the PLA, crossed the narrow Hainan Strait and annihilated the Kuomintang regime there. The survivors narrowly escaped to Taiwan, watching their comrades get gunned down on the docks. 33,000 men died in the battle. Hainan Island has been a part of the People's Republic ever since. I've always been fascinated by Hainan and its parallels with Taiwan. Physically, the two islands have much in common. They're seemingly sisters. They're about the same size and share the same climate. Geologically, they share massive mountain ranges and long plains. They both have large Han majority populations, Hainan with some 9 million and Taiwan 23, and the Republic of China held on to one, but ended up losing the other. And today, one is unquestionably a member of the PRC, and the other isn't. In 1950, after Hainan fell, everyone thought that Ta Taiwan itself would collapse, and that everyone included the United States. But no invasion would come, and the Republic of China and its ruling Kuomintang Party continued along across the Taiwan Strait. And that's where we find things 70 years later. The most obvious proximate cause for why the PLA never attempted to invade Taiwan is the outbreak of the Korean War. After Kim Il-sung invaded South Korea, the U.S. government sought to put a lid on any other potential communist incursions, including that of the PRC. They parked the 7th Fleet in the Taiwan Strait, which makes it extremely hard to conduct invasion operations. The communists have ever since considered the Korean action a rude foreign interference on an internal matter. Certainly, an aircraft carrier makes things harder, but if you take a closer look at the circumstances that allowed for a Hainan invasion, you get the feeling that it would be a mistake to assume that a Taiwan invasion in the 1950s would have played out the same way as it did in Hainan, even had the Americans not packed an aircraft carrier in the Taiwan Strait. And the first reason is the weakness of the Republic of China on Hainan. Much like with the rest of the mainland China, the ROC in Hainan was a teetering regime. For one thing, the Kuomintang government branch out on Hainan Island was clearly the ugly ducking of, of the two islands. Nationalist Governor Xue Yue, a brutal governor who, by the way, inflicted his own 228 incident-style slaughter on the Hainanese in the name of anti-communism, complained to reporters about President Chang's reluctance to send re reinforcements in the quantity and quality requested. The shortage of resources would only continue. Even as the rumblings of a Hainan invasion grew larger, the Kuomintang focused yet harder on Taiwan. The Kuomintang government knew that Taiwan mattered more and that Hainan's days as an ROC holding were numbered. They had basically written it off from the start and evacuated as many troops as they could back to Taiwan. Some 70,000 troops were assigned back from uh, Hainan to the main island. This preparation for a Taiwan invasion sucked resources away from the rest of what remained of the ROC, which included Hainan. 120,000 more reassigned from the island of Zhoshan, 3,000 from Dongshan Island. Chang even briefly considered giving up Jinmen. The strategy of focusing on Taiwan is cold, but it did the job. Chang's troop reassignment greatly vexed the PLA as they made plans at the time for the invasion of Taiwan. By the end of the troop assignments, Guobom, the Kuomintang had 400,000 troops stationed at Taiwan, double what the PLA planners had originally assumed. The PLA had hoped to encircle and annihilate the entirety of the Kuomintang forces at Zhoshan and Hainan before they can escape, so foiling this plan had great consequences. The PLA would have needed to add some 100 to 200,000 additional troops to make sure that there was combatant parity. Each troop would need to be moved there, leading to thus another major issue. Hainan and Taiwan are islands. Troops can't walk on water, so they need to be transported, adding a new layer of difficulty. The PLA very publicly lost the Battle of Jinmen, a much smaller scale island battle, but they learned fast for Hainan. 318 junks carrying a large PLA landing force succeeded in avoiding nationalist bombardment, successfully standing, landing on the north and west coast of Hainan in April. There they joined with the insurgent Hainan guerrillas to launch attacks on the nationalists. Once landed, the island only took up seven days to conquer. The PLA had made, and has, made a lot of hay of the success of the Hainan invasion. It's a mark of pride for them, and they pointed it has proof that they can successfully pull off an amphibious invasion. Their propaganda glorifies their soldiers' achievements, and you could essentially call it their D-Day. Full credit to what they have done, the Hainan Strait can be volatile at times. It's known for having sudden typhoons and rough weather. Any sort of amphibious military landing on land held by a hostile force requires massive logistical and coordination. But the Hainan Strait's just 19 miles wide. Both sides can literally see each other on an average day. A ferry across takes an hour. The Taiwan Strait is 100 miles wide. Last time I checked, 19 miles is less than 100 miles. It's estimated that crossing the Taiwan Strait in a boat in the 1950s would have taken the better part of an entire day. 
That's a long time and a long way to be pulled by junks in what is essentially a raft. The experience sounds even less fun when you take into consideration the fact that the Taiwan Strait is not a bubbling brook in the forest. The Taiwan Strait has been called many things over the years, but one thing in particular stands out to me, the Black Ditch. Year-round strong winds and swells batter the strait, not counting the six typhoons that on average pass through the strait during the winter months. Many soldiers dreaming of a glorious victory will find themselves blown overboard to a watery death. Finally, the narrowness of the Hainan Strait and a plethora of good beaches allowed the PLA to sail their junks across uh, along the coast to suitable beaches far away from national bombardment. Taiwan's rocky shores, massive mountain ranges, and sheer cliffs meant that only a few such strategic locations would be suitable for landing. Any first-line boat thrown off course would quickly find themselves isolated and annihilated by defenders. These landing spots are obvious to both sides, and the ROC worked hard to make these critical areas more inhospitable to any potential landing force. The logistics of mushering such an effort became a real headache for PLA planners. Crucially, the communist landing force in Hainan benefited from a functional communist guerrilla force operating amongst the native people. Today, the contributions of the native Hainanese and the taking of the island are minimized. Declarations made even at the time mention eight mainland commanders, but only one native islander. It downplays the fact that an insurgent communist force had been operating in Hainan, fighting the nationalists on and off for the better part of 23 years before the invasion. Led by the commander, Feng Baizhou, the communist movement on Hainan Island at times whittled down over the decades, but somehow persisted despite fierce suppression and lack of material and support from the mainland. When the communist landing force got off their boats, the Hainanese were waiting for them. They sheltered the soldiers in their bases inland until it was time for the attack. Hainan had a guerrilla communist force, but Taiwan had no such thing. Why? First, the communists benefited from the gross mismanagement and cruelty of the Hainan Guomindan force. Hainanese suffered from the brutal anti-communist suppression and massacres perpetrated on them by the nationalists. They were also shockingly poor. Much like many of the other people on the mainland, they wanted a change, and the revolutionaries offered it. And one last thing before I conclude is the question of Chinese identity in Taiwan and how it had changed after 50 years of colonial administration. The people of Hainan have considered themselves Chinese for centuries. Basically since the Song Dynasty, Hainan has been Chinese. So when it came time to reunite with the motherland, Hainan went willingly. They were reclaiming an identity which had always been theirs. Taiwan, on the other hand, did not see extensive Han settlement until the 1600s, owing part to its isolation and fierce aboriginal population. The island has always been a frontier land in the Qing Dynasty's holdings. Only the wildest and wooliest would settle there. My point is to bring up that uh, the connections binding Taiwan to the mainland were not as strong as those binding Hainan to the mainland. Taiwan's half-century at a Japanese colony would only more so cement these differences. This long period of separation helped prevent the rise of a functional Communist Party guerrilla force in Taiwan, but it would be wrong to assume that that was the only reason. In the end, you had a, a large variety of reasons, which would include the intimidating 100-mile Taiwan Strait, the Guomindan determined to favor Taiwan's defense over Hainan's, the Korean War with the United States interference. These factors make it clear that the people who saw Hainan's fall and immediately thought that Taiwan would follow were drawing the incorrect conclusion.